Listen to the conversation between Bob Wills, who is a foreign student advisor at a language school, and Angela Tung, who is a student, and complete the form. First, you have some time to look at questions one to eight on the form now. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Now listen carefully, and answer questions one to eight. Hello, Foreign Student Advisors Office. This is Bob Wills speaking. Can I help you? It's Angela Tung here, Bob. I'd like to make a request for special leave. Can I do that over the phone? Hello, Angela. You can make that request by phone, but I'll have to fill the form out. Let me get the special leave form. Okay, here it is. Hmm. Tell me your student number, please. It's H for Harry, five seven one two. H five seven one two. Okay. What's your address, Angela? I live at ten Bridge Street, Tamworth. Ten Bridge Street, Tamworth, and your phone number? The telephone number is eight one zero six seven four five. Thanks. What course are you doing? I'm in the writing class. Writing. Who's your teacher this term? Mrs. Green. She spells her name like the colour. Thanks. Hmm. When does your student visa expire? Let me look. July fifteen. July fifteen. Okay. Which term do you want to take leave? Do you want dates? First, I have to write a term number. When do you want to take leave? In term one. Okay. Term one. Now, can you tell me what are the exact dates? I'd like to be away May thirty-one to June four. Okay, I've got that. You'll miss four working days between May thirty-one and June four. Is that right? Only three. I'll be away over a weekend. I'll be back at my classes on June five, so that's three days away. Look at questions nine to twelve. Now listen to more of the conversation between Angela and Bob. Why do you want to take leave, Angela? I'm going to visit my aunt May. She's my mother's sister. She and her husband are my guardians while I'm here. Where do they live? About fifty kilometers from here, near Armadale. Do you have to take so long if they live nearby? My mother is coming with me. She's come for a holiday, so she wants to have some time with May, and I want to spend some time with my mother too. Aren't you going home soon? I've applied to extend my time here. I expect to go home in twelve months. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a presenter on a radio phone-in show. The presenter is talking to a woman who was bitten by a poisonous spider. 
First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Today, we're continuing our traveller's tales. On the line, we have Amanda Toddington, who had quite a nasty experience in Australia last year. Isn't that right, Amanda? Yes. My husband and I were on holiday, and we were staying at a friend's house on the coast near Brisbane. It was towards the end of the holiday, and I was about to go into the garden and enjoy my breakfast. I walked out into the kitchen, slid my left foot into my shoe and felt a tiny sting. It was pretty painless, but I shook the shoe off my foot and saw this tiny spider running out as the shoe hit the wall. Anyway, not being an expert, I presumed the worst, that I'd been bitten by something that was going to kill me and I completely lost control. I don't think I've ever screamed so much in all my life. We'd been told beforehand to always check our shoes before putting them on, as it's a common way to get bitten. So I suppose it was my own fault, really. So what was it that had bitten you? Tony, that's our Australian friend, he immediately asked me if I knew what had bitten me, and I pointed to the corner of the room where I'd last seen the spider. He picked up a jar and found the creature in the corner where the shoe had hit the floor. It's a red back, he said, and he gently placed the jar over the spider. The funny thing was, we'd been talking about some of the creatures we needed to be careful of a few days previously, and as he said the name Redback, the conversation came flooding back to me, in particular, the fact that the bite can be extremely painful. i found out since that the Redback is from the same family as the Black Widow Spider, and it's the female that does the damage, which it turned out was what I'd been bitten by. You must have been absolutely petrified. You can say that again. I remember feeling quite confused. I wasn't in a great deal of pain to begin with, and yet I could see from our friends' faces that they were concerned. Tony explained that the venom, or poison, of the bite spreads quite slowly, so the pain doesn't feel too bad at first. Gwen, Tony's wife, brought an ice pack, and Tony held it against the bite to make it less painful. Apparently, you're not supposed to put a bandage on the area, as this can make it hurt even more. Uh, Tony tried to put my mind at rest by explaining that this was quite a common bite, that the hospital would have an anti-venom and that everything would be OK. But I was beginning to panic. We were flying back to the UK the next day, and I really didn't know what to do. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. So what did you do? Well, Tony phoned the doctor, who told him to check my symptoms for the next hour or two. As time went on, the pain became very intense, from my foot right up to my knee. My husband was on the internet and was reading out the possible symptoms. I wasn't feeling sick, and I hadn't yet developed a fever, but I had a terrible headache and my foot was beginning to swell up. At this point, Tony decided to take me to the local hospital to be on the safe side. I really didn't want to go, as I had visions of being kept in for days and all our plans being spoilt. But Tony and my husband insisted. When we got to the hospital, I was relieved to see how casual everyone was when Tony explained I'd been bitten by a red-back spider. They told me to take a seat and got on with their work. And did you receive any treatment? By the time I got to see a doctor, the pain was very intense indeed, and I was getting quite upset. The doctor decided to give me a dose of an antivenom, which he assured me would eventually deal with the problem. 
Unfortunately, he also explained that it wouldn't have an immediate effect and the symptoms might last for several days. But the story has a happy ending. My husband managed to book us onto another plane one week later. And even better news was that the symptoms of the bite finally cleared up after about 24 hours. Within a couple of days, I was back to normal again. So thanks to the spider, we managed to extend our holiday by a week. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a talk by a wildlife specialist on a type of bird called a kiwi. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Auckland Zoo on this sunny Sunday afternoon and to our special Kiwi fundraising event. My job is to tell you all about the amazing little Kiwi and your job, hopefully, is to dig deep in your pockets. <laughs> Now, for the benefit of our overseas visitors here today, I should explain first of all that the kiwi is the national bird of New Zealand, and sometimes New Zealanders themselves are known as kiwis. Now, while kiwis in the wild are a rare sight, the kiwi as a symbol is far more visible. Apart from being in toy stores and airport shops all over the world, you'll find them on our stamps and coins. The kiwi is the smallest member of the genus Apteryx, which also includes ostriches and emu. It gets its name from its shrill call, which sounds very much like this. Kiwi! Kiwi! Kiwis live in forests or swamps and feed on insects, worms, snails and berries. It's a nocturnal bird with limited sight, and therefore it has to rely on its very keen sense of smell to find food, and to sense danger. Its nostrils are actually right on the end of its long beak, which is one third of the body length. Now, here's an interesting fact. Although kiwis have wings, they serve little purpose, because the kiwi is a flightless bird. Since white settlement of the islands, Kiwi numbers have dropped from 12 million to less than 70,000. And our national bird is rapidly becoming an endangered species. This is because they're being threatened by what we call introduced animals. Animals which were brought to New Zealand, such as cats and ferrets, which eat Kiwi eggs and their chicks. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30.
Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. And so we have launched the Kiwi Recovery Programme in an all-out effort to save our national bird from extinction. There are three stages to this programme. Firstly, we have the scientific research stage. This involves research to find out more about what Kiwis need to survive in the wild. Then secondly, we have the action stage. This is where we go into the field and actually put our knowledge to work. We call this putting science into practice. And then we come to the third stage, the global education stage. By working with schools and groups like yourself, as well as through our award-winning Kiwi website, we are hoping to educate people about the plight of the Kiwi. As part of the action stage, which I just mentioned, we've introduced Operation Nest Egg, and this is where your money will be going. It works like this. It's a three-stage process. First of all, we go out to the kiwi's natural habitat and we collect kiwi eggs. This is the tricky part, because it can be very difficult to find the eggs. Then, in safe surroundings, away from predators, the chicks are reared. Now, this can be done on predator-free islands or in captivity. They're reared until they're about nine months old, at which stage the chicks are returned to the wild. So far, it's proving successful. And since we started the program, some 34 chicks have been successfully raised this year, and their chances of survival have increased from 5 to 85%. However, it's not time to celebrate Kiwi survival just yet. About 95% of Kiwi chicks still don't make it to six months of age without protection. Which is why Operation Nest Egg is so important. And we ask you to give generously today. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. Listen to the last part of the lecture. As you listen, complete the notes below. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Last time, I said that a lot of Irish people left the country and went to England, America and many other foreign countries. Today, I'd like to talk about the emigration. The effects of immigration were not all bad. The immigrants experienced a lot of hardship in their new countries. There is a famous story about a park in Shanghai, where... Chinese and dogs were not allowed. Well, in England, until into the 1950s, signs for jobs sometimes read, Irish need not apply. The immigrants often experienced discrimination, but they formed many organisations to look after their fellow emigrants. Many of these organisations later became very important. In America, the Irish chose politics as the way forward, and significant cities 
were controlled by Irish politicians. This movement reached its peak with the election of John F. Kennedy in 1960. His grandparents came from Ireland, and his election had a significant impact in Ireland, helping the process of recovery of self-confidence, which we have today. Today, there are 70 million people of Irish descent living outside Ireland. In America alone, there are 40 million people, and 10 million of these people have a 100% Irish background. They carried the culture of their home country with them and adapted it to their new home. They made changes, which would be unthinkable in the home country, and we often laughed at the Yankees' Irishness. In fact, any immigrant who came back to live in Ireland, often after many years, found it very difficult to fit